Chaco. I'm a, I teach here at uh, at SIPA, uh, but I also have a, a day job at the uh, at the UN at the UN Department of Safety and Security. So I'm I'm really excited about this uh, this fireside chat in both capacities, um, SIPA and um, and the UN. And today we're going to focus on new developments in biotech and their implications. Uh, with regards to conflict and the risks of potential weaponization of these new new technologies. Um, and and to do so, I'm really grateful, really, really grateful that both Jim and Chad were are able to join us uh, today. Um, they're both leading minds in the field of uh, of biotech. you you have their uh, you have their bio at the in the program, so i won't I won't read the whole thing. Um, one in the interest of time, because the list of achievements for both of you um, is quite quite impressive. Um, but here, Chad Roy, who's joining us online, professor of microbiology and immunology and core scientist at the Tulane National Primate Research Center. Uh, Chad, you also serve as the director of the Infectious Disease Area Biology Scientific Core located it within the Division of Microbiology. I picked up from your bio, I wanted to highlight one thing from your bio and one thing that's not in your in your bio in the program. One, um, I was intrigued and, and mildly frightened when I saw that you work with a range of infectious and highly toxic agents, considered biological threat agents, um, which explains partially why you're on Zoom with us as opposed to in person. Uh, but I also I also know from previous discussions with Chad that you've actually managed a a lab in the U.S. Army, and I think that perspective also will be will be really really interesting. Um, so welcome, Chad. Um, great that you could you could join us. Jim uh, Jim is the uh, professor of medical engineering and science and professor of biological engineering engineering at MIT. Um, also an institute member of the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard, one of the founders of the field of synthetic biology, uh, and just picked up also uh, a MacArthur Genius Award recipient, and many more. So please look at the, uh, look at the bio. So both Chad and, and Jim, thank you for joining us to explore the, the issue of biotech and, and pot potential implications for um, for warfare. This is a fireside chat, so which means a couple of things. One, uh, we really want this to be a dialogue between Jim and Chad, but also between Jim, Chad, and, and all of you. Uh, so it's going to be fairly informal. Uh, and also, Chad and Jim just don't hesitate to respond to each other, add to, to each other. Um, I do have a few, few questions, but we really want to keep it a conversational note. The other rule, um, and maybe I'm projecting my own ignorance on all of you, but I don't really understand this technology that we're going to discuss. So I've asked uh, Jim and Chad to dumb it down if need be. I hope that that's okay, um, and explain what that what these technologies are. Uh, so these are just the the two rules. Okay. So first thing, I wanted to ask you about the state of play, the state of scientific progress when it comes to biotech. And the risks and the implications, because biowarfare is nothing new. But I think that with recent technological progress, it opens up new possibilities, but also new risks on a scale that's probably unprecedented. Um, in other words, I wanted to know whether, and we're going to try something here, whether this, we're going to show you a scenario. We're going to show you a 57 second clip some of you will recognize. And by the way, the other thing about fireside chats is that we're allowed to have fairly unsophisticated cultural references, and, and this is one of those. So we're going to show you a clip, and I, because I want to ask you, Jim and Chad, how close to reality is this? All right? Let's do this. Okay. Uh, made nanobots. Microscopic bio robots that can enter your system by the slightest contact with your skin. Programmed with DNA to target specific individuals. Heracles was. It was designed to be the most efficient weapon in the arsenal, passing through people harmlessly before reaching its intended target. 
Put Pogacev and one of five the nanobox so that can kill anyone related to the target. Anyone? Well, since it's DNA based with further modifications, yes. Families, certain genetic traits, single nucleotide variants and polymorphisms that could target a range from individuals to whole ethnicities. You infect enough people, and the people become the weapon. People have recognized um, no time to die. And so, because that's the, that's what's go, going on. The, the evil genius working off an island and developing this DNA-based technology as a, and weaponizing it as a, as a weapon of, of mass destruction. Um, so we just thought we'd start with that because my first question to both of you is, is this pure sci-fi? We're nowhere near the ability to do that, to manipulate bio-agents for, for such purposes or this is pretty close to reality when when we look at the state of uh, scientific progress. Jim or Chad, who wants to start? Chad, do you want to get us started? Is that oh, okay? Sure, I'll, uh, sure I'll, I'll start off. I thought I was intimidated with uh, the MacArthur genius reference with Jim, but then showing James Bond clip, now I'm really intimidated. Uh, so uh, just a little bit about biological threat agents and, and, and the kind of weaponization of them just to to so everybody understands um really what whoop really what uh <laughs> yeah so really what we're talking about in, in terms of of the the agents themselves those those are natural agents they haven't changed and mark's completely right that they, they've been around for quite a long time and have been used um for for you know for a very long time as as weapons uh in wars what has changed however is and, and so there's some some commonalities in those those agents in the in the group of of these bacteria viruses and toxins that uh have historically been used and are still of concern today uh that i think is is worthwhile just to just to mention before we start talking about um the, the the threat of new technology being combined with those. One is that, thankfully, uh, most of these agents don't show up clinically in our communities. So they're, they're not very common. For an example, let's think about smallpox. Smallpox was eliminated from the face of the earth and is only held in, in two laboratories, you know, on the, on the planet right now, uh, clinical samples and otherwise. So you're not going to see smallpox show up in your community, uh, uh, thankfully. Um, one of the, the effects of that, however, is there's no clinical or very little clinical um, knowledge of the disease or the diagnosis. And this is a, this is a commonality in all these, these agents. If you can think from movies and otherwise, things like plague, anthrax, uh, smallpox, um, you know, that, that, that sort of thing. And, and, and finally, a, a major commonality is that most of these, some, but, but most of those are not transmitted by aerosol. And this is a very important aspect because the clinical manifestations are different uh, when certain agents are presented by aerosol than, than otherwise. Anthrax is a perfect example of that. When someone uh, contracts inhalation anthrax, if untreated, it is a 100% deadly disease. Uh, but gastrointestinal or cutaneous anthrax is not, and it's, and it's very treatable. Now, in a potential release or in a, in a scenario where, where this would, was released, um, the most probable route is aerosol. And, and so th those are three commonalities uh, that we can all kind of rely on for biological threat agents and weaponization. The important, and, and the reason that I provided that, that information is that new technologies, and, and, and you know, Jim can, can comment on this, um, has provided a brand new adaptation to these very known agents, group of agents, that are highly regulated in, in many places. Uh, United States is an example of that. We have a highly regulated system 
to possess and use uh, the these this group of agents um, that's that's uh, uh, controlled by our Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, the the new technologies, however, have provided unparalleled access and adaptation to deliver those agents in ways that maybe we hadn't thought about before uh, in, in terms of new threats or novel threats to, uh, you know, to the population. So um, maybe, Jim, I, I'd love for you to, to comment on that as it relates to adaptation of some of the new technologies to some of these, these common, common agents. Yeah, 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 thanks, thanks Jim. If I may just also tell you, to be honest with the audience, the reason why we also showed the clip is also it speaks to one of an interesting anecdote, something you, uh, an interaction you had a few years ago. Um, love for you if you can share some of that with the, the audience. Uh, thanks. So I, I very much appreciate the movie, but I'm a huge fan of James Bond movies, primarily for the character that was shown, not James, but his quartermaster, the tech guy that always comes with cool tech. In this case, he didn't develop this tech, but Share the background. So, uh, two points. First, the scenario painted in the movie is science fiction. We currently cannot do exactly what was outlined, but scarily, each of the aspects of the technology, bar one, currently exist, but haven't been integrated. So, maybe I'll speak to those in turn, and then I'll share the anecdote that Mark refers to. So, the first is the idea can you target someone's DNA? And really, that involves two key technologies that have developed recently. First is sequencing. So the idea of sequencing is that inside most of our living cells, with the exception of blood, you have DNA that captures our genetic background passed on from our parents. Sequencing efforts that really started decades ago have now advanced where it's incredibly cheap to do even whole genome sequencing, meaning we can sequence your entire genome. Here in the United States, we have commercial efforts like 23andMe, Ancestry.com, DNA.com, that enable folks to get after their family backgrounds. They don't do whole genome sequencing, but they can look at so-called SNPs, small bits of DNA that can associate you with a particular country, ethnic background. It's readily easily now to do that. And we can do that off of just hairs found on your clothing. So celebrities, public figures are at risk of being sequenced and having that information shared. My dad grew up in the Bronx. He's one of the most paranoid individuals I know. And yet he actually subjected his DNA to one of these kits after my sisters shared with him. He's a big fan of hereditary background and very proud of his background. But I shared with him, I said, look, you're so concerned about your information being stolen. You just shared your most valuable information with a commercial entity. Anyways, we can get to that information readily. Now, can you target it? I'm sure many in the room have heard of CRISPR, really a dominant technology of the last decade that has caught the world's attention. Briefly, it's a technology, interestingly, that was adapted from bacteria. So it's an immune system in bacteria that evolved to allow them to protect themselves against viruses that are specific to bacteria. Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Duwadna recognized they could repurpose that technology to begin to target genes for both research and therapy. And so what does it do? It basically allows you to program a bit of RNA which is the intermediate between DNA and making a protein to go after a strip of DNA. And it largely has now been used to go after and try to correct genes that might have a mutation due to either a disease that was inherited or a disease that was developed from environmental schemes. Our group and others have shown you can use it for diagnostics. So you can actually target the RNA or DNA of a pathogen that's been expressed. So we developed COVID tests, we developed Zika tests and Ebola tests using CRISPR diagnostics, CRISPR technology. You could, in principle, use it to identify sequences in an individual you'd like to target. The related technology is can you now couple it with the expressed of a toxin that might be able to kill the person or kill the organism? And the answer is yes. Uh, Mark referred to I helped launch a called synthetic biology, which is basically using engineering now from really a control standpoint to modify living cells, be it bacteria, yeast, plant cells, human cells. And we can now program them to keep a toxin off and only turn it on in the presence of certain DNA, which might be the DNA in your cells. The, the, the exception is on delivery. So as, as Chad mentioned, you know, bioweaponry has been with us for decades. Largely has consisted of taking very nasty pathogens 
that have evolved in nature and weaponizing them. And largely the weaponization is making them easy to deliver. Scary as being aerosolization. Spray it around and infect a population or go after a military force. The challenge is in my world of health, human health is can you get these engineered devices into enough cells? And we really haven't figured out how to do it. We can't do it yet by touch. We often do it through engineered viruses that can go into a limited number of cells. You know, to Mark's point, people are figuring out different ways. There's interesting things you can repurpose from the spider venoms, uh, from snake venoms that would allow you to penetrate the skin. There are efforts known as microneedles that can actually deliver vaccines and other ones through the skin without triggering pain receptors. So it goes deep enough that it can penetrate and reach your, your, blood, your, your blood vessels, but not enough that you get a response. So you can imagine that could happen without you even sensing somebody then infected you. Now to the anecdote. Eight years ago, I was visited at MIT by the director of DARPA, which is the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency here in the United States. It gets a lot of attention. Many countries are trying to reproduce DARPA. It's our large source of very cool Department of Defense supported innovations. They claim the internet, they claim stealth bombers, various things. Uh, anyway, she visited with me um, just a few years after CRISPR became quite popular, and she challenged me. I, I'm not a bioweapon expert. I don't think about bioweaponry. I don't think about how I can use my technical bioweaponry. But she challenged me in my office, how could you use CRISPR for bioweaponry? And I said, well, it'd be interesting that you could sequence a head of state grabbing the hair off of his or her clothing and then target them in a very specific way, develop a bioweapon that could be delivered to go after her, and then, and then it was President Obama. She says, we thought it, we're not worried about that. There's so many easier ways for somebody who wanted to take out a head of state to do that than it would be engineering a bioweapon. So they pressed me, what else could you come up with? And I said, okay, if I had to come up with it, now I'm gonna think of, okay, I'm gonna go after population. I'm gonna engineer CRISPR so that I can identify strips of DNA that would be specific to a particular population. It might be an ethnic group, it might be uh, members of a nation state. And I'm gonna inoculate my troops from that. I'm then gonna release that agent CRISPR enabled into it. And she says, spot on. And in fact, she shared they were quite worried about a number of nation states. Now, we've not seen anything along these lines materialize, but it was interesting to then see the James Bond movie come out where a rich guy on an island came up with tech that you could do it. And we can speak to what is the risk of a rich guy on an island posing a big threat. Um, I think it is quite small for many reasons, but I'm happy that this session's on because I think the threat for nation states is actually quite high. Thanks. Thanks for that. And and also, Chad, for the um, the framing and the, the emphasis on the delivery. Chad, I don't know if you want to add or respond to, to Jim, because my next question was when I hear about that um, and how perhaps James Bond is still sci-fi. However, we're getting there is and, and the different elements in the, the scenario are, are fairly realistic. One question I think for us is. What conversations are you having in the scientific community? You're both at the forefront of, of research that could very easy or very easily, I don't know if that's the right word, but quickly become of dual use and be manipulated and weaponized. In the scientific community, in your labs, are you having conversations about, about that risk of your innovations, your technology being used, as we say, falling into the wrong hands. If you, if you could just give us a flavor of those, those conversations, are you sometimes sitting around saying, wow, this is, this is dangerous stuff. How do we make sure that it doesn't fall into the wrong hands? Are you, are you having these, these conversations, Chad, in, the, in Tulane? Sure. So uh, I'll, I'll back up just a bit and, and comment on what Jim said, because there's an, another aspect of that that is it, it kind of blends into the response of, of, to this question as well. So one of the things that we do in, in my laboratory first, I was with USAMRID at Fort Detrick, so the Institute for Infectious Diseases uh, that was run by the US Army, uh, where we uh, developed vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics for specifically for biological threat agents. And so in, in doing that, we were not only developing those medical countermeasures, but we also uh, there was a necessity to have models of disease to test those countermeasures in. Like I had referred to earlier, you know, these types of diseases don't show up in, in, in communities generally. They're very rare or they're non-existent. And so we need a test bed to test those vaccines and therapeutics and diagnostics to some extent. And so, you know, 
and that, that's been an ongoing effort uh, well before I was there and, and now down at Tulane as well uh, and other places as well for, for 50 years. Uh, the United States is engaged in biodefensive efforts. And, and, and this is a part that kind of blends into what Jim was talking about. There have been many advances in terms of vaccines and therapeutics and diagnostics for those biological agents. Um, anthrax is a good example of that. We have a new, new generation anthrax vaccine uh, that's out and et cetera, et cetera. But one of the, the major concerns now is engineered threats that will circumvent the immune response, for instance, that vaccines that have been developed for that very threat. Um, so there's a necessity to develop another countermeasure that will block that engineered threat. So this idea of engineered threats and and basically uh, uh, cultivating uh, those known agents that will circumvent either an immune response or a protective mechanism from a therapeutic that's been developed that may be on its way to licensure by our our, our, our FDA uh, is a you know five alarm fire for the last couple of decades. On, on on having at least two countermeasures, for instance, on uh, on one of these threat uh, agents. A, a, a perfect example of that is the isolated toxin from Clostridium uh, botulinum. So the most potent toxin, potent material on the face of the earth. So a uh, very, very lethal um, uh, toxin and having very few countermeasures. Right now, we have no countermeasures that are FDA approved for the treatment of, of, uh, of botulinum toxin uh, for the purposes of, of what we're talking about today. Um, so, you know, that there's uh, the, the engineered threat uh, as it relates to new technologies is, is actually been ongoing for, for you know, now decades. Uh, to try to keep up with um, with the, the potential for uh, for the the development of an of an engineered threat, which kind of weaves into what what Jim was talking about in terms of the the new technologies that are um, you know uh, coming full force in in this area. Maybe I'll, I'll yeah, comment uh, follow up on chat. So you know it's interesting. Biotechnology as a community is about fifty years old. So it really grew out of discoveries in the early 70s where folks discovered enzymes in marine organisms that could be used to cut and paste DNA. So it allowed us to transfer DNA between organisms and make proteins, really the workhorses of cells, either for good or for bad. Interesting, the community has self-policed itself, self-regulated itself from the very beginning. So when you look back, I was just a little kid, as in fact, many of you weren't even born, it's such a young room. Um, in the early 70s, but in fact, in the United States, the reaction was concerned not about bioterror, but of accidental release or harm to the communities where biotech was being conducted. So in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Berkeley, California, there were significant community upheavals against efforts that at MIT, Harvard, UC Berkeley, UCSF, Stanford. And the communities began to self-regulate, had a famous conference in Asilomar, California in the mid to late 70s, putting in place regulation that to date had actually largely served well. Our discussions still largely center around, are we going to accidentally create something that could escape and cause harm? And are we introducing consumer goods that also may do unintended negative consequences, be it in farming or health? Increasingly, we're hearing about concern about bioterror, I think, because of the ease now with which one can se sequence and synthesize. So make strings of DNA, RNA, as well as engineer it and model it with AI. So I'll give two anecdotes, very recent. So my lab, in addition to synthetic biology, works on using AI models to discover and design new antibiotics. We face a major crisis for lack of antibiotics to face the growing resistance threat. We published a paper in Nature in December where we presented explainable AI models enabling one to discover new antibiotics. Now, there's an old adage that it's easy to discover a powerful new antibiotic. It's very difficult to discover one that's also not toxic to the patient. So you kill the infection, but you also kill the patient. And so to counter that, we also developed three different toxicology models based on screens on human cells, 
where you can now take a compound, put it through the AI antibiotic model, would it make for a good antibiotic? If yes, make sure it's not toxic against human cells. We published this without having the dialogue that then ensued, which is a number of folks reached out and said, could this be dual use? The tox model, meaning could you now use the toxicology model to identify compounds that are incredibly toxic? And the answer is yes. Right, so a theme to keep in mind is really any technology can be dual use that doesn't diminish the negative use of concern. But in this, the concern is now you have models that could be easily used to screen in the genomic space and the sequence space to identify new molecules to Chad's point that can not only evade the immune system, but evade already our developed countermeasures. So it can be quite scary. The second is literally I stepped outside just before this session. I'm on the editorial board of science and was just looking at a piece that was submitted where the concern is on new AI models that are being developed to design new proteins. So probably the biggest AI development in biotech is a platform called AlphaFold. This is a system developed by DeepMind, which is part of Google, that uh, looked at structures of proteins that have been gathered over many decades and now enables one to predict the 3D structure of a protein sequence alone. It's very powerful, doesn't do it completely accurately. It's 80 to 90%, so it hasn't fully solved the problem, but enough to be both useful and dangerous. And a number of groups are now using it to engineer proteins, largely for good, using the proteins for health to address problems, but also the concern is you could develop a toxic protein. And what's interesting, and I would challenge this group, because it's outside of my expertise, is the group wants now, I wouldn't say regulation, but oversight to review the models, but offers no policies on what you do if you identify a model that could be used to ill good. In fairness, my view is every model can be used to ill good if that's your intent, but what do you do and how do you control for it? No, th thanks for this, because I, we've already had, I think, even this morning on the, the AI talk, there was talk about what's the right balance, because you both also, I think, argue for, uh, I mean, everybody knows the, the, the extremely positive impact of these new technologies. So what's the right balance? You talked about self-regulation. Um, Chad, I know you've had some experience or some exposure to the Biological Weapons Convention. Um, can you both speak a little bit to how you see the way forward in terms of government role, regulation, uh, role of international institutions, these conventions, or and along with self-regulation to manage these these risks? Chad, do you want to do you want to start? Sure. Yeah. And uh, so I yeah I've spoke once at at the uh, the biological weapons convention that was being held in Beijing that year on new technologies, but it was more in the line along the lines of delivery technologies that were originally developed for therapeutic administration of, of, of uh, you know, of uh, respiratory medications uh, that could be adaptable for delivery of, of biological threat agents and, um, and the, you know, to guard against that. Uh, in in terms of self regulation, as, as Jim had, had mentioned, or uh, pretty heavy handed regulation, which I think is absolutely necessary, um, uh, that that we experience. We work in high containment in my laboratories. We possess many of these select agents, and so we celebrate regulation and heavy regulation of that. Uh, CDC just left our laboratories last week, uh, where we're inspected and. Um, uh, there's 100% accountability and inventory of that. Unfortunately, many parts of the world don't have that kind of regulation and that oversight uh, for the use of these uh, these agents uh, for development of, of different medical countermeasures, for instance, and those disease models that I that I mentioned. Um, in terms of the Biological Weapons Convention, there's many signatories to that, and there's many countries that have read the Biological Weapons Convention, which is only five pages long, it's a very small document, but have not had it, have decided not to sign it. And uh, the policing of that, um, which uh, I don't know if there is a policing of that. So bringing to bear uh, new technologies and adaptations to those, those known agents or new agents that may be created in the lab, is a remarkably difficult thing. And I, I, I can't imagine um, what it would take for that kind of policing to take place, especially in the case of, of, of those, those two stories that, that Jim told, where things are actively being created in the laboratory and 
any you know reasonable way to um, to regulate that uh, in this context. So um, I, I think that's that's mainly why the regulations are at least in in the United States are based around that known group of agents and and any kind of manipulation of those that have been deemed to be um, you know uh, toxic or deadly uh, in infections and um, have a high risk of of kind of a, a, a terrorism use. Thanks, Jim. Do you want to? Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll say a few things. You know, I, I think at a high level, unfortunately, it's incredibly hard to properly regulate this. Meaning that if you have a bad actor that wants to act in this space, the bad actor is not going to follow regulations. And it's not that it's low tech or low cost, but it certainly is low tech or low cost relative to nuclear weapons, which we heard referenced this morning, in that even a relatively poor nation state could put a state-of-the-art biotech facility in place. I, for one, um, I've been visited by your colleagues in different intelligence agencies through the last decade or so. I'm not concerned about the rogue 18-wheeler trailer that's driving around the desert looking to build a bioweapon. It, it's just not feasible from the tech that's needed, the contamination challenges, and things. But if one has a properly trained population and a commitment for a relatively small investment, you could put up a fairly scary facility. So how do you track it? Where do you go? It's very difficult. I, I work a lot in IP from a biotech standpoint, and from an AI or modeling standpoint, you can feel nice that you put in for a patent around yours, but there's no way to enforce it in most cases because they're largely going to use it inside their facility to develop a new drug. This is now just in the nice guy space, but in the corporate space. And so one doesn't do it. And so it's not clear to me what's the best way. Now, I think nation states should be encouraged to put in regulations to stop the bad stuff from occurring and have general buy-in and signal strongly to it. I don't see how one stops the bad actors. And I'll give a specific example I referred to earlier. DNA synthesis technology has begun to take off. So the ability that you can send a sequence to a company that could then make that bit of DNA for you. Now, you still have to get it inside a living cell, a lot of things to go, but it's the secret sauce is really the DNA, the genome. There are efforts in place right now to screen all orders. So they can screen orders to see, is this a potential bad actor that's trying to make smallpox and synthesize smallpox? Now, you can envision how you could chop it up and send it to several up. Unfortunately, the technology is now being developed where very soon we're going to have desktop synthesizers where even an under-resourced university professor like myself could have a synthesizer, multiple synthesizers. In my lab, we hit a button, and within 24 hours, it'll produce the DNA that you need. So now you run the risk of how can you track that except maybe who bought the machine and you challenge them. So again, you know, your job is much more challenging than my job. Of uh, thinking about how does one actually regulate something that's effectively unregulatable from a bad actor standpoint. And both, of you, and I want to open up to the floor, but I have one last question. Because both both of you raise interesting points, also that connect to previous conversation this morning around AI, whether AI is an equalizer, and to what extent AI is an equalizer. I have a similar question with biotech. Is it fair to say that it's an equalizer when it comes to offense? So, because you mentioned would be relatively easy for a host, a number of, of nation states, even um, fairly poor nation states, to set up a facility and, and manufacture those weapons or the, the use the technology to manufacture those weapons. Um, so is it fair to say that when it comes to offense, you know, harm, you know, doing harm, biotech is an equalizer amongst member states? Uh, and the power imbalance is more when it comes to defense, protecting populations, where perhaps a country like the United States would be much better equipped to protect this population as opposed to a, a number of countries out there? Or is it the same, where equally, every country is equally um, vulnerable to the, to the, the use of bio, um, biological agents? I, I'll, I'll just follow up with one, one thing that Jim said, that there's another scenario. And so to your, your point, Mark, I think that democratization of biotechnology in the world, just via the internet and what's on the internet is, is, 
has made it available to everyone. I mean, there's a lot of smart people everywhere. And so, um, you know, absolutely positively. Um, there's, there's other scenarios where, you know, just after COVID, for instance, when we were looking at, you know, different emerging viruses and that those, all the different beta coronaviruses that could be out there. And um, we happened on sequences of, of, of uh, viruses that shared some of the same attributes as SARS-CoV-2. So to get those sequences and to make provirus, to characterize them in the lab, to see if, you know, for instance, their stability in aerosol uh, and ability to cause infection is high or low or otherwise just in research, would that represent a, a you know, a dual use potentially? Well, the answer is in the hands of a bad person, yes, absolutely. That would be considered a, um, you know, a, a nefarious use of, as Jim said, biotechnology that could be on someone's essentially on their desktop in a couple of years to create provirus where all you need is an emailed sequence um, so, you know, not, hopefully not that that's happening, but I, I mean, it's really up to that, you know, that decision-making point, regulation or no regulation. And, uh, so I think with the advent of that, you know, both good and bad, uh, in, in, in terms of democratizing the use of this, uh, throughout the world. Yeah, Mark, so a few points, uh, I think you, you hit it. The premise of your question, I think, is correct. I think it's much easier for offense. Uh, again, uh, biotech is not low-tech. It's not inexpensive. So it has not really been democratized the level it should yet in terms of biotech for good, whether it's training young folks, having uh, democratization of therapeutics, vaccines, and I'll speak to that, come back. But as a na if you have nation states that want to set up a bioweaponry program, it's not going to be very hard from... Garnering the resources, the bigger biggest challenge will be proper intellectual capital. Defense is so much harder. Defense is really hard, and I don't think we're well prepared as a world for defense against bioterror. And we're certainly not well prepared for what nature has in store for us, which is I like to speak to. And again, when your colleagues from the intelligence agencies come visit me, I'm much less concerned about the engineered side than I am what nature has next. There's going to something jump from an animal into a human. It's coming. We don't know when or where, but it's probably going to be pretty soon. And we're not prepared. And I think the defenses are very similar for both. And it's where I think we as a community, world community, need to address both challenges. Can we be better prepared for the engineered virus, the engineered bacteria, the toxins that the bad actors are developing, but also the evolved bacteria, the evolved viruses, the nasty toxins that have developed in nature that are coming for us. No, thank you. Thank you for this. So let's, and I'm glad also you, you mentioned this, and Chad, you mentioned COVID because not to get into the debate about where COVID came from, but I remember that you probably felt the same way. Every six months, there was a new variant. We thought we'd gotten, you know, we're done now. And then there's a new variant. And you started reading online, people thinking, there's got to be an evil genius somewhere out there who every six months goes on his laptop. I'm assuming it's a male, um, you know, and just changes the code again. And so we start again. So there's... the. I, I thought at the beginning I'd start with the, the COVID example, but then we thought James Bond would be a bit more exciting um, and less, perhaps less traumatic. Um, so thank you, Jim, Chad. I'd uh, love to open it up now for, for comments and, and questions from the, uh, from, from the group. Um, and, uh, and again, I, I think what's interesting, and, and I know Jim and, and Chad as well, you may also, if you have questions to the audience or challenges to the audience, I think that's also the value of this, these interactions between two very, um, two different communities. So, and if I can just kind of ask you to introduce yourself. Sure. Uh, thank you so much. I'm Michelle Lickingle. I'm with USAID West Africa Regional. Um, I have two questions. Jim, you kind of touched on this in the beginning, but how could potentially biotechnology improve biodefense strategies if we're at that point um, to protect against biological warfare? Um, and the second question, we had looked um, yesterday at the intersection of technology and conflict, 
Um, so a question I have is what role can biotechnology play in global health secure, uh, security, um, in particular in these conflict zones as you know, in Sudan, Ethiopia, and so forth, where healthcare infrastructure is oftentimes compromised. Thank you. Do you guys want to take a, a few at a time, or would you rather respond directly? One at a time? Okay. Maybe I'll, I'll jump first, Chad, and then I'll pin to you. So I'll actually go back to my DARPA uh, anecdote from my, uh, with the director. In the same visit, I had shared with her my concern that we needed to put in place national effort to prepare for bioterror and outbreak, diagnostics, therapeutics, vaccines. And her response was interesting. She weighed it off and said she thought it had a place more in private sector. And I pushed her and said, what's the business model? How, you're not going to have a biotech company get ready for bioterror with a rare, luckily, pandemic. And, and I think there was, a, there was misguided thinking by leadership in our country and other countries. And I don't think we've learned enough from this pandemic in getting ready for the next one. I think my quote to her was, we need standing fire departments to get ready. And I think we have the technology to get ready for the next one for diagnostics, therapeutics, vaccines, be it bioterror or a new outbreak. And yet we're not making that commitment. And I think, again, given the talent in this room and, and where you've committed your social careers, we need to convince leadership around the world to make it. It's actually not that big of an investment. It's a fraction of what we're doing to support complex, armed complex right now could actually fully arm the world against the next pandemic. Related to then health equity, you know, I was very disturbed and bothered by what happened in the pandemic. And to your point, where defense, it, it's not a fair playing field in that you didn't see the vaccines, which had real value for helping those at most risk, the elderly and those underlying health conditions, were not distributed to much of the world. They were very slow on distribution. And by the time they got there, people had already been exposed in different ways. And I think we, with technology, can get after that. And again, on the vaccines in the United States, it was so-called Operation Warp Drive, which I think will go down as an interesting case of public-private partnership. And say again to the DARPA director, I think teaming up with industry from an nation state standpoint would be really quite meaningful. And again, for small investments, I know there are many billionaires in this country that are trying to shoot us off the planet to go to Mars. I'm much more worried about the seven or eight billion of us down here. And with those sorts of investments to get ready to your points for whether it's a bioterror or a, a, a nature-based outbreak. Thanks. Chad, do you want to you add anything? I couldn't agree with Jim Moore on his comment about preparation and our next pandemic. And there's hard work that needs to be done to do that, but we could do it. And those of you listening, um, um, if at all, uh, we do one thing, and that's to prepare for the next, which is un undoubtedly coming. I, I want to respond to the second question. Um, you know, we've been decades into developing countermeasures for uh, different um, biological threat agents, as well as emerging threats. Ebola is a good example of that, which is a very isolated, um, you know, episodic disease that's deadly. One of the difficulties, however, is the populations that we're treating with these developing countermeasures is altogether different than um, the, the populations that are doing the developing. And what I mean to, when I say that is that um, in West Africa is a perfect example of that. The nutritional status of that population is much, much different than industrialized countries, um, as well as the health pressures that the individuals, uh, a majority of the individuals that live uh, in those areas have. So they live with many diseases every every day, and preventive care is 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 not uh, practiced as as much uh, because of resource constraints and and otherwise. So many of the countermeasures that are developed, vaccines is a, a perfect example of that, relies on that person's immune system to present an immune response that's consistent with protection against that particular disease. Uh, but when your immune system is constantly activated, as it is with populations that 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 live with with tons of health pressures, vaccines don't seem to work the same way as they do in those populations. So, not necessarily personalized care, but just having considerations and understandings of different needs of different peoples uh, throughout the world 
in terms of development of some of these countermeasures is really, really important. And it's, it's something that uh, doesn't necessarily come out in the design of those, those countermeasures uh, when, uh, you know, when, when, they're, when they're being developed. And uh, so I think those lessons are being learned, but um, uh, in, in particular, that, that's, that's been one of the very difficult things when clinical trials or otherwise are done in these areas and these countermeasures just don't work the way that they should um, through no fault of that population. It's just different needs. Um, and, and we're just starting to understand that. Thanks, Chad. Um... Next, next round of questions. Uh, can I just see a show of hands, just also just to be able to, to manage time? We have about five five questions. Okay, thank you. Um, let's go. Let's go counter. I think the gentleman at the back, and then we have the table here. Yeah. We've got about yeah fifteen minutes of five questions. I think it's on. Yeah. Thank you. So um, two short questions. One is the, the COVID pandemic, uh, it's a bit maybe on the nose, but in what meaningful ways has uh, the pandemic changed the field of biotech, if, if at all, if there's, uh, if there's gonna be uh, been far, far reaching change from the experience that we all lived. And the second one in the vein of uh, biotech for, for good, is there room, space, uh, possibility of, of using biotechnology to offset the effects of uh, that climate change is having on the environment and uh, living organisms everywhere? Thank you. Thank you. Again, do you want to- I'm happy to jump in. Yeah, I'll, I'll, briefly, uh, yeah, go ahead. You know, it's interesting, I'll, I'll speak to the first in order. So I think the, the biggest impact that the pandemic had on biotech was generating extreme interest in RNA as the centerpiece. So we're now, we talk about being we're in the age of RNA as a result of the RNA vaccines that Moderna and Pfizer put out. And so when you look, much of the investment has gone toward RNA. Challenge again to the point that Chad and I brought up earlier is still delivery. Vaccine, very easy on delivery. You can just deliver it into the muscle, you get the immune response to that delivery. The challenge is, can you get to this? So we'll see if these companies can sustain but you know it will be it will be interesting. Um, your second point, remind me on the oh for climate change. It's a, it's this growing space and interest. Um, I'll give two examples and then I'll speak to the challenges. So the two examples, one is there's a, lo a lot of interest, including in our lab and others, of can we engineer bacteria to break down and upcycle plastics. So there are efforts to show there are enzymes that were uncovered in bacteria that were found in plastic landfills. They can break down PET, so substance, easiest thing to break down, but substance in uh, water bottles, et cetera, that are easy to break down in groups, including ours, are now showing you can upcycle them into commodity chemicals, fuel, electricity, and even edible protein. I would have us eat it. Maybe the McDonald's might serve it in their vanilla shakes, but it could likely be used for livestock. Second is we and others are beginning to use efforts now to get after uh, fieldable diagnostics for warming oceans getting after harmful algal blooms, vibrio outbreaks, coral reef lesion. The two challenges are as follows. In the biotech, it, it, the challenge is always, where does biology outcompete chemistry? So in my world, it doesn't matter. I can exist as a professor doing cool stuff in biology, even though chemistry is much better at what I do. But if it's something novel, I can publish it and people applaud. But in biotech, you got to outcompete chemistry. And the challenge in climate is chemistry has some really good solutions that need to be implemented. The second is scale. Can you scale the beauty of diagnostics and therapeutics? Vaccines is it's a one-to-one. -one. Now you still have to manufacture, you have to distribute, but it's on a scale that's easy. Climate, boy, it's a big, big challenge. And can we smartly do things which I think we could of reaching out to maybe high adopters, high end users, similar to EV electrical vehicles did, to get after, for example, plastic recycling on a small scale and growing. But scale becomes a big challenge. Thanks, Jim. Chad, do you want to? I'll just, I'll comment briefly on the first question. Jim's got the second question, so I don't have anything to say with that. In terms of the first question, the meaningful change is really, I think is experiential for the COVID pandemic and watching the rapid evolution of a virus in the human population, which beta coronaviruses are known to do. They rapidly change and how that affected our development, rapid development of a countermeasure, the vaccine, uh, that protected was a wonderful uh, part 
of uh, a not so wonderful scenario that protected many people. However, the durability of that vaccine was really challenged with the evolution. As Mark had mentioned, you know, was it somebody, you know, uh, the wizard Oz behind the curtain, uh, you know, changing the changing the 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 virus every every you know every, every so uh, often um when, when in fact uh you know beta coronaviruses uh the the family that those you know the that SARS-CoV-2 belongs to are known to rapidly evolve to where they become very very efficient in replication in a, a mammalian system uh but their pathogenicity drops dramatically when they become very efficient and they just kind of hang out in in certain areas of the uh, of the body and so we all live with six or seven different coronaviruses not causing disease in our body at any time that we're exposed to throughout our you know throughout our life uh SARS-CoV-2 will probably end up that way as it evolved in real time during the pandemic so now that we've had that experience, um, you know, the world has had that experience with an emerging infectious disease, uh, we'll be better out to, 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 you know, combat the next. So, yeah, I think there was some very, there was other things, but that was one of the biggest meaningful changes that, that came about uh, as an experience of the, the you know, the COVID um, experience. Thanks, Chad. Why don't we just take a few questions and then we can see how you want to divide up the answers just in the interest of time. I think I had uh, someone at this table. Let's take a, take a few. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Benedita from Indonesian Mission. Uh, I have a very uh, quick question, actually, because, um, well, in, in our line of work, we are, in a, uh, we are thinking about how to develop some of the, uh, the regulations uh, better. And uh, in this case, we already have the, the BWC, but even the BWC, um, it, it has its own uh, limitation itself, including in the, uh, the verification regime of the BWC. So uh, based on, uh, on that limitation, I just would like to, to ask you a question. Um, do you have any um, sort of like a, a best practices on how uh, some of the other regime can be further strengthened uh, in the sense that um, countries or sort of mechanism can have um, sort of like a protocols perhaps to, to have an early detection uh, so that we know where the, the sources of the, uh, uh, the first biological threats, for instance, so that we can actually develop sort of like a preventive measures uh, instead of uh, responsive measures. Uh, just that, that question I would like to ask. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's yeah, Sarah and then, and then gentleman up front here. Thank you so much. Just two quick questions that build on some of the things you've already said. You mentioned a few things about, I guess, why we haven't seen these attacks, because I remember, not this movie, I haven't seen it, the, the sorry, James Bond, but I remember Outbreak with Dustin Hoffman. <laughs> uh, that was sort of anxiety provoking in uh, my time. So it seems, though, that, like you said, it's relatively easy you know, to set up such a such a such a lab and um, nefarious actors, you know, could have an interest in this. So why haven't we uh, yet seen? And also that the regimes are kind of flawed and not effective. So so what are the kind of main factors, uh, incentive structures, maybe for why we haven't seen major uh, bio attacks? And then also the convergence element. You did mention obviously AI models and how they can be dual use to some extent. And I also heard. Chad speak in a way to the to the data problem, right? Like that if our training population is different than the treatment population, uh, there's a bias effectively, right, as to who's treated. But I was wondering other convergences, mis and disinformation, also when we talk about biodefense and how uh, a population could be manipulated, as we've seen uh, with COVID, for instance, like to not believe uh, in a certain treatment being effective. So if you could say a bit more about that and how do we defend ourselves then against that and that I guess has to do with also trust in science and, and, and some of these bigger issues. Thank you. 
Thanks. And then we have one uh, here front table. Thank you very much for, for this panel. Uh, very quick question. One of the workflows at the UN focuses on AMR. Um, and uh, since uh, Professor Roy was talking about the next pandemic, which is undoubtedly coming, I was wondering whether it would be related to AMR in your, what's the possibility that it's going to be related to antimicrobial resistance? And uh, we, the UN is focusing on a holistic approach called One Health that uh, um, encompasses uh, the works of uh, health systems, uh, uh, food systems, and like how to react collectively as a society um, to to uh, reduce the threat of AMR. But I was wondering if there's a specific scientific approach to it in the sense of the role of biotech or research on AMR to, to counter it uh, at the source. Thank you. Thank you. Chad, do you wanna, do you wanna start? I'll start with that last question first, if that's okay to respond to the AMR question. Uh, although they're all great questions. Uh, uh, and, and, I'm, and I'm glad that someone brought up One Health. We're, you know, right now we're dealing with, um, you know, the spread of avian influenza in the United States, um, which is, um, uh, 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 you know, chronically um, uh, kept by migratory birds that doesn't kill them, but uh, it's, a, it's a chronic gut infection in migratory birds, and it's been around for decades. Uh, and and uh, however, when those birds cohabitate with, in this case, cows and other farm animals, that uh, infections have happened, and now that's that's being, you know, transmitted to other farm animals. And in the case of one individual in in Texas, an actual infection uh, of H five N one, and we see this pop up, you know, in in different isolates throughout the, the world. One of the the early things, at least in the 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 present outbreak of this is that there's very little to no communication between the uh, uh, individuals that are surveilling or diagnosing in the veterinary world and animal health world to the human health world. And, and the crosstalk between those are strained at best. And even though the science that's being practiced in each one of those stovepipes is absolutely top notch, uh, when it's not translatable into a kind of this one health idea um, that it's very limited in terms of, of global surveillance of, say, a AMR, or in this case, a, a virus uh, that has been isolated a long time ago, uh, but, uh, you know, that may pose a human health threat and it getting into our milk supply, for instance. Um, so, um, I, I, you know, I, I can't emphasize enough that that one health idea and, and COVID's a perfect example as well uh, in terms of, of, of natural sourcing and natural recombination events that take place that makes an animal pathogen a human pathogen, you know, over many years or, or decades um, is the key to um, early identification so we can put up a a preventive type of posture rather than a damage control type of posture that, um, you know, we experienced in the COVID pandemic. And, you know, I fear in the avian influenza uh, pandemic as a, you know, harbinger of things to come uh, in, in the, the, the next the next coming years, unless those those barriers come down. So thank you for that question and, and bringing that up. It's a it's a point that uh, everyone should should remember. So uh, so many great points on those questions. Maybe I'll take them in turn and see if I can remember. Um, so on this surveillance, I think there's a real opportunity for AI coupled with sequencing, and a need for global surveillance efforts. So I think we need to have distributed efforts across nation states to track what is out in our communities that might have been released by a lab, might have been a bad actor, or likely have evolved in nature. But I think we've got real opportunity here. We've had about 200 viruses that have infected humans in the course of us living on this planet. And yet the estimate is that there are many thousands poised in animals ready to jump into humans. 
And so it's a big threat that we need to address, and I do think AI opens the possibility. The second set of questions, one on, you know, why haven't we seen more? You know, I'm not sure. You know, again, you know, I think bad actors should, if they were, should adopt kind of schemes what a lot of pharma do, which is buy it, which is buy the innovation. You've got actually stores of bioweaponry that you could purchase if you wanted to do. The challenge is delivery. So we've had, uh, we've had instances, there's largely biotoxins that get released, aerosolized, but they're not infectious. So you'll have true terror, you know, it might be in a subway system or in a city, another area, but it's not through an infectious agent. The challenge with each of these is, uh, I, I don't want to say it's a dark joke that I do, but the, the person will likely die before they can have the impact because these things are incredibly dangerous. And most folks don't appreciate it. And so I think there might have been attempts where, in fact, something did happen, but the person ended up expiring. That's your, that's your point about the 18 wheeler. Because the 18 wheeler is, well, that is the, guy, the, guy well, well, is the contamination. So separate from that, the person gets harmed, but that you wouldn't be able to conduct your experiment because of everything. Yeah. So, to your point on disinformation and lack of trust, I think we need to do a much better job than we did in the pandemic. We now speaking from my side, which is the science community. I think in the science community, when we speak to scientists, we do a really good job of saying, I don't know when you don't know the answer to a question. Why? Because there's 500 people out there who are going to go after you if you start spitballing, freewheeling up there and say, that's not, what are you talking about? But if you're in front of Anderson Cooper on CNN, he's not going to go after you. And I saw so many of my colleagues speaking with, on stuff they didn't know what they were talking about. And they should have said, I don't know. And maybe then speculators say, we, we don't know a lot. And I think we lost trust by claiming we knew stuff that we didn't know and then also being Hilly Draconian on this is what you need to do without considering possibilities. I think we need to do a much better job of that going forward. You know, the AMR is actually what I spend most of my time worried about. Two points, and I'll specifically speak to AMR in the bacterial space. I don't think the next pandemic will be an AMR bacteria. I think it's going to be a virus, probably an avian flu type virus. But in the AMR bacterial space, it's interesting. The UK Commission did an estimate that. Uh, that by 2050, if we don't address the AMR crisis now, we'll have 10 million deaths per year worldwide, which is more than from cancer, well more than we saw at the peak of COVID. And, you know, a challenge of how to think about it is that the market is really broken. You don't have antibiotic companies. Uh, the large pharma have gone out of it because it's much developed in antibiotic because it does a cancer drug, a blood pressure drug, and antibiotic you take once, maybe over three to five days, costs a few bucks. Cancer drug, blood pressure drug, you can charge thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars. You take many months, if not the rest of your life. If you develop a new antibiotic, they shelve it. And so you see companies that no longer exist because they were bankrupt, went bankrupt after they got an approved drug. We need to figure out nation state public private partnerships to address this challenge. It's an addressable challenge. And notably, I like to say that it's on every education, educated person's list of existential threats to humanity. And it's the cheapest threat that can be solved. For small tens of billions, it can be solved for the lifetime of everybody on this planet. And every other major threat is going to take trillions. Should be addressed, but here's one that you know one could with right policies and right resources could go after the AMR challenge. Wonderful. Thank you. Just in closing, um, because we need to we need to wrap up for lunch. I just wanted to give you both the opportunity to just share final thoughts or final messages, advocacy messages, recommendations to the uh to the audience just very briefly if you if you wish to do so if you have any any final insights or or messages to the, um, the diplomatic community jim do you want to start and then i'll, I'll start so um I, I guess maybe i'll just flip it a bit because I, I think we went a little dark at times you know I, i'm a i'm a major optimist and i see ai and synthetic biology as two of the dominant technologies of the century and i think together they can be harnessed to address some of our biggest challenges we have to worry about the dual use and the untoward, but I think they should also be harnessed to really go after big challenges. And I'm very thankful for all that you do because we need to have them properly implemented in particular to, to prevent the bad actors from, from doing harm. Wonderful, thank you. Chad, your last word with you. Sure, um, so I've, I've been in biological defense for the past almost 25 years and I've, I've seen where we've come from uh, in terms of countermeasure development. And I, I, I share Jim's optimism uh, with new technologies in the development of those countermeasures and just what we saw in, in terms of development of the vaccine in the, in the COVID experience, how quick that was and how a 
life-saving countermeasure got to so many people so quickly. And so if we can just continue advocating for that theme and for that to be the theme going forward, that we're using our technology in a way um, that is uh, so much more rapid, very, very similar to what Jim mentioned about sequencing, you know, desktop sequencers are coming. Uh, the, the, you know the same thing with 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 medications and uh, continued avocation for uh, the use of biotechnology. Um, yeah, and so uh, again, uh, thank you for what what you do in terms of uh, of advocating for uh, for for things like this. Thanks. Well, please, everyone, join me in in thanking Chad and and Jim for a uh, for a wonderful session. Brilliant. Chad, thank you for joining us online. Uh, really, really appreciate it. And Jim, great that you could also come in, in person. Um, lunch is served. I think you're back at 2 p.m. Thank you. <laughs>